Thank you. Yeah, very water. good. You know, now that I've tried this, I don't think I can live without it. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, uh, you want to talk about our world or another one? So, This one. Okay. So uh, actually a parallel universe to this one called Ames, Iowa, which is the town where I grew up. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's the home of uh, Iowa State University, which is a school that in a lot of ways is, is similar to, uh, to this one. Um, the, the main difference being that unlike uh, ASU, ISU is not embedded in a, a great big city, so it's a, a kind of a self-contained academic community out on the, <clears throat> out on the high prairie. And um, Ames, uh, yeah, different universities develop different sort of areas of specialization depending on who's working there and what they're good at. And one thing that uh, Iowa State got pretty good at in the middle of the 20th century was metallurgy. And so um, when metallurgy became a really important topic uh, during the, uh, the Manhattan Project, um, some of the people in Ames were, were called upon to make use of their, uh, of their skills uh, in refining uranium. So I'm not talking about enriching uranium, which is a, a, a more difficult process uh, and, and requires bigger equipment. I'm talking about the simple process of of taking the, the ore um, that is mined out of the ground and, and producing a fairly pure uh, sample of, of uranium from that. Uh, they needed it because a few hundred miles off to the east in Chicago, uh, a, in a racquetball court, uh, a, the, the, the world's first atomic pile was being constructed. Um, and um, the, the way this thing was built uh, is basically a big cubicle stack consisting largely of, of blocks of, of really pure graphite. And, and um, among the graphite was uranium in a sort of roughly spherical configuration. And based on the uh, calculations that they had done with the samples of uranium that they had, they had a pretty good idea of how big that sphere was going to have to be in order for them to get the, the critical reaction that they were looking for. Um, so, um, so they built this thing up one layer at a time uh, using the uranium that they could get. And at some point, uh, a new kind of uranium started coming in from my hometown, which is called Spedding's Eggs. So Spedding, Frank Spedding, was a, a metallurgist who, uh, who worked there. And, uh, he and some of the people he worked with had come up with a new way of re refining uranium, which is based on the thermite reaction. So I don't know if you know about thermite. It's a very popular chemistry experiment among young and old pyromaniacs, but you basically, <laughs> you take basically rust. <laughs> I thought that would bring some, uh, some people out of the woodwork. Um, <laughs> You take basically rust and aluminum and mix them together, and once you get it lit, which is difficult to do, but once it gets going, it's incredibly exothermic and it's 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 spectacular, and you ended up you end up with molten metal uh, all over the place. Um, so anyway, it's a good way of getting oxygen stripped off of one metal and moving it over to another one, and um, that was what they needed to do in the case of refining this uranium. Um, of course just making a big pile of, of, of powder out in the middle of the prairie and setting fire to it wasn't exactly the right way to go about it. And so they built these sort of crucibles, uh, these really thick-walled crucibles in which they would mix the ingredients, and then they would weld it shut and set fire to the thing, and the reaction would take place inside. And much, much later, it would cool off to the point where they could go and open up the canister, and um, inside would be this beautiful little oval sort of uh, this hardened puddle of, of uranium, hence the term Spedding's eggs. Um, not quite like cuckoo eggs, but <laughs> much more powerful in a certain way. Um, so, the, uh, so these were then put on trucks and transported to Chicago and, and incorporated into the, uh, the atomic pile. And um, 
the, these eggs were so much purer than the uranium that they had been working with up to that point that they actually had to change the design of the pile at that point. So if you look at a cross-section of that pile um, uh, as it was finally built, the bottom part of it is a, a perfect geometric sphere, but the top part is a kind of flattened uh, oblate sphere because they realized that they didn't have to have as much uranium because they were getting better stuff from, from my hometown. So that was the, uh, the, the kind of place that I grew up. Uh, uh, there were kids in my Boy Scout troop whose, whose uh, dads had been present uh, in that racquetball court when the, um, when the reactor uh, went, went critical. Um, there were, uh, uh, this is kind of a digression, but one of my favorite aspects of that experiment was that they were worried that it might go out of control, and so they had buckets full of uh, a solution that was known to be a, a poison for this reaction, a very potent a damper of this reaction. And um, they, so standing on top of the pile, they had graduate students <laughs> holding buckets of, of this, this stuff, and uh, their job was to, to dump the, this stuff into the pile if the needle went beyond a certain level, which you would do very, very quickly if it happened. Um, but on no account were they to spill even a drop of it into the pile beforehand because it would completely destroy the utility of the pile and they would have to, to rebuild it. So anyway, um, for the rest of the, the Manhattan Project and after the war, Ames was still a place where a lot of that kind of research went on. And um, I can remember going into, I think it was Spedding Hall at, uh, at the university and seeing under glass a wine bottle covered with the signatures of uh, the people who were present when the, uh, when the experiment had, had succeeded. I don't know if it was there permanently or, or on loan, but um, it was one of these cheap Italian wine bottles that's in a little basket. And uh, the, the scientists had all signed their names on the, uh, on the wicker surrounding the bottle. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, and later on when I was in college, I worked as a research assistant um, in a, a lab there. And I can remember um, uh, talking to a crusty old technician uh, who liked to give the young guys a hard time. And, and he took a, a bar of metal about the size of a pencil out of an envelope on his desk, and he handed it to me. He said, what do you think that is? And I began weighing it in my hand uh, and um, guessed all of the dense metals I knew of, like osmium, um, because I was a smart little physics major, and I knew who, what all the heavy metals were. And uh, when I had run down the list of all of them, he told me that I was holding a bar of uranium in my hand. Um, <laughs> So I kind of froze up for a second, and he snatched it out and stuffed it into an envelope and uh, said, you probably shouldn't hold that for very long. <laughs> so the, um, with that as background, I'll, I'll quickly tell a story from my Boy Scout troop, uh, just sort of going back to, to Bill's comments about getting a passion for science when you're young. Um, Boy Scouts do all kinds of projects to learn about different things. And uh, one of the projects that we were supposed to be doing was growing plants. And um, growing plants is a thing that happens quite a bit in Iowa. And so it didn't seem like a terribly interesting project on its own. <laughs> and so some of the dads in our troop decided they were going to enliven the thing by adding a little sciency twist. And so one of them got some corn seeds that were as close to sort of genetically identical as he could make them. They probably had all come off the same cob or something. And he took them across campus and gave them to one of the metallurgists who went down into the hot room, buried deep below the, the building, and picked them up with a remote manipulator arm and put them over a thick lead glass wall and set them down next to a highly radioactive isotope for some period of time, and then plucked them back out, brought them to the safe side of the wall, and took them to our next Boy Scout meeting and handed them out to us. And our instructions were to take them home, plant them, water them, and bring our plants back in a few weeks' time. And one of us, would, the, there would be one prize given out for the tallest plant and another prize given out for the weirdest mutation. 
And so we all participated in that, in that project. And my plants died because I'm that kind of guy. I am the <laughs> notorious black thumb. But, but we got both kinds of plants, uh, both sort of fully normal-looking corn plants and other plants that were not identifiable as corn by, any, <laughs> by anyone who's ever seen corn. And we had all seen it. So um, um, that's... Uh, that's what it was like growing up in, in my town, and, and it's an interesting and touching thing about that place that I didn't realize how weird that was <laughs> until I had left that town and gone off to places where when I would tell stories like that, people would look at me in a very funny way. <laughs> uh, so thank you. You know, when I, when I was a kid, I worked at a folk festival, and um, I, I, I love music, although I'm not very musical, and uh, I remember specifically um, a few events where, where the, the best musicians uh, in the festival would uh, be asked to improvise. And it was amazing, because you'd see the first one, and it would just blow you away. And then you think, oh, the poor second guy. And they'd blow you away. And you could, what, you, what you watched was this incredible buzz of talent and excitement because each person was excited by the person before them. And, and you know, when, when I put this together, we had no, no plans. I just thought, we'll wait and see what happens. And it, I hope that you felt the same buzz that I felt on this stage. Uh, it was just uh, <laughs> Now, what we're going to do, I've decided that there's no need for us to discuss anymore between ourselves, from what I've heard. So we will take a break, and we're going to go directly to the questions from the audience, because I think uh, I'd like you to have a chance to interact with these people, and I'm in awe of them, and let's, let's thank them once again. Okay, we've selected, there have been great questions, and we won't have time to get through all of them, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And I'm gonna, uh, some of them are directed at individual people, uh, some, most of them aren't. And so um, I'll just throw it open and people can, can answer uh, for each one. This one, um, the first one I'll start with, I think it's an interesting one. It says, uh, from Anne, if you could give us all a one word piece of advice for our own science storytelling, what would it be? And P.S., thanks for showing us how sexy science is. I don't think that referred to your shirt, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so, one, you know, that we can probably do. One word, I guess we can go across, or uh, if you want. One, any, any, well, I, it doesn't have to be everyone. Anyone want to give a one word piece of advice? Yes, go ahead. Algebra. Learn algebra. Ooh. Ooh. I got one word. Yep. I got one word, and that one word is ambition. That is, that is something not encoded by any practicing exam in the school system. Yet, in fact, if you look at the most successful people there ever were, they are not the ones necessarily who got straight A's. Those are the ones who had ambition, which overrides it all. Yeah, okay. I agree. It's a long word, but it's a good one. Um, I, I would add, the, I would say passion. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in the terms of storytelling, too many people, uh, we said this last night too, too many people, I think, are afraid to inject their own story or their own passion when they're talking about it at science. But if you don't talk about what you're interested in, no one else is going to be interested in it. Empathize. What? Empathize, because the best people, the best teachers, uh, of science and the best writers about science are the ones who can empathize with people who don't quite get it yet. 
I was going to say the same thing. Any other? Any other? Anyone else want to throw in? You've been I, jumping ahead. No. I would, I, I would yeah, just I, say, I, just, yeah, Richard. Yeah. What? I was going to say em emphasize in exactly for the same reason, but I'll say instead poetry then. Poetry. Excellent. Excellent. Anyone? Don't I have would to. just say that it, you should be able to tell it so that your mother can understand it. <laughs> hey, that's good. My mother never listens, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> and if your mother's a theoretical physicist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> She should tell you then. No, all right, fine. <laughs> okay, here's one that's actually a little bit related um, to, and, and, but, uh, to what Neil was just talking about, but I think it, it, we can expand on it. I've always, Anita says, I've always wanted to be an astronautical en engineer, but I am horrible at math, but I've got lots of passion. Can this dream ever be a reality, and where do I start? So it's an interesting, you know, I guess I'll start with that. I mean, I think, ma as, as Bill said, you know, Math is the language of science, and I think you, you, you have to be able to ha be adept at it. Math is the language of the universe. Yes, you're right. I agree with you. Brian? I agree, but, 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 but let me just finish, and then we can... Uh, uh, that too many people think that um, you have to be a mathematical wizard to be uh, even a physicist, I mean, much less an engineer. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but... Uh, you know, it, it takes all types. Uh, I know people who won the Nobel Prize. I know people, y y you don't have to be the best mathematician in your class. You don't have to be a whiz. It takes all types to do science. And that, well, any stereotype just doesn't work. If you're interested, do it. What's that have to do with you knowing Nobel laureates? Who, who were not the best in their class. Oh, fine. Thank you. And, okay. and who weren't necessarily even that strong in math. Okay. But the other thing, I would just say, you say you're bad at math. I bet you're not that bad. And I just want to remind you that there's, when it comes to math, there's no substitute for practice. It sucked for me. <laughs> it sucks for, I mean, you just have to practice. So when you come to me, you come to me and say, oh, I'm bad at math. I am open-minded, of course, but skeptical. I'll bet you can do it, whoever you are. You know, that's an important point. Uh, we, we, we were talking about it last night, too, that, and, and it touches on what you said. You know, uh, I like science museums because, often because they show science is fun, but science is, is hard work, like anything, to do, like music, like anything else, to do it well. And it takes a lot of work. So you just, and if you don't enjoy it, you can't do the work. But, but just enjoyment alone isn't enough. You've really got to be willing to work at it. I think what's really going on here is people presume that in order to be good at, in order, they presume that if the math is not coming easy, that therefore you'll never learn it. And, uh, and I meant it literally that math is the language of the universe and it's like any other language, especially a language that does not share the Roman alphabet. So for example, if you wanted to study Chinese, it looks completely intractable at first. It looks like Greek. It, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, and you can ask the question, how long does it take one to become fluent in Chinese? if you're not Chinese yourself. And so it can take years, and five years, almost 10 years, if you never go to China. You go to China maybe five years of intensive exposure, and you've never done that with math. Imagine that level of exposure to math, what kind of fluency you would have at the other end of that pipeline. So at least give yourself the opportunity that any person learning a foreign language would give themselves before you turn around and say you're not good at math. Brian, do you... <laughs> get me started. Yeah, you don't want to get him started. I, mean, I, I know that from experience. Um, you're actually only you're a professor of math as well as as well as physics, probably the only one on the table. Yeah, and the here. question that comes to mind for me is, how do you know that math is the language of the universe? I was going to say, what about I, the multi? The universe told me. <laughs> Pretty okay. good first approximation, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, okay, we're now doing but, science but by revelation. Go, Lawrence, but, before you go, I'm yeah. just wondering, because I, I have a question about this. Uh -huh. Could you imagine that one day far in the future we encounter some alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you've done to understand the universe, and we bring out our math books with all our theorems and physics, and they turn to them and say, math, 
We tried that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it takes you just so far. <laughs> <laughs> and the real way to do it is like this. I would say that whatever that real way is, well, is not manifest to us at this moment. And until that day happens, where an alien tells us how backwards we are, all I can say is that the math that we did invent out of our human brain, as you surely know, Eugene Wigner said, the unreasonable effectiveness, effectiveness of, of mathematics in describing the universe, the fact that it works at all is sufficient enough for me. But, 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 no, but I'll, I'll, here, I want to I wanna, I wanna have a no it. Just because, wait, it's just because you still can't figure Just out your string bigger. theory. Back in your Don't come corner. to crying to me. Back in Don't come crying to me. You can't figure it out. Well, in fact, you got him started. See, you got him started. Said, "Don't get me started." Don't get him started. <laughs> no, but I want to go on record. He warned you not to get him started. Yeah, I know. I told you, but I want to go on record. I want to go on record, and this is a momentous occasion. I want to go on record as agreeing with Brian. Um, <laughs> Is anybody but, uh, keeping the record? But no, in the sense that uh, it is fascinating if you're a theoretical physicist to wonder when you find something fascinating, whether uh, at math some mathematical formalism fascinating, whether it's a property of our brains or whether it's a property of the universe. And, uh, and we just don't know, I think, the, is the answer. We, if you stri if string right, theory... Right, but, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. I find it slightly confusing because, Neil, you describe math as something that we create. So why is it the thing that we create is somehow intrinsic to the universe? Isn't that awesome? It's our description. It's a, it is it's awesome. a awesome. surprise. It, I don't, it is a surprise. I don't lose sleep over that. I celebrate it. It's a good thing. <laughs> I, I celebrate it too. Yeah, but, 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 the question, but it is a question. There may be limitations yeah. on understanding the universe because of the way our brains work. And I think... That's uh, surely and, the case. That's yeah, surely the and, case. And for Republicans, it's already happened. But it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> But, but, but um, uh, no, but seriously, that's an interesting question, and we, you know, it, it, we really have to wonder about that. And if you're, again, uh, working, as, as some of us are at the forefront of physics, we, you wonder at some point when, when it's going to end. It's some Republicans. Yeah. Well, but to the questioner's question, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't worry about the possibility that it, mathematics is going to turn out to be ineffective in describing the universe and use that as a reason to not keep practicing. <laughs> and press on. This That's right. Be, okay, next question. Could be an engineering perspective. Yeah, no, there you go. Excellent. Next question um, from Joel. What do you believe or hope will be the most significant scientific advancement over the next few decades? And I, I, have, I, know I have a pat answer to this, but I'll wait to see if anyone else has one. No? We don't okay, know okay. what the next most significant exactly. scientific discovery is going to be, for crying out loud. Exactly. <laughs> the point I always say, if I what knew you, what Why I are mean, you guys exploring Mars? What are you going to find there? We don't know. That's why we're going. Yes. <laughs> crying out loud. Great. And, and as an wait, 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 okay, that's not go on. It's No, not wait, 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 no, there are two kinds of exploration. One of them is, I have no idea what I'm looking for, but maybe I'll find it when I see it. Okay, another kind of, uh, another kind of you explanation. Can't, you, you can't argue with him, I've learned it. It's another kind of exploration is, we think we know what's going on, and we want to test our hypotheses. That's another kind of exploration. And one of them is, is there life somewhere else? We know there's life in at least one place in the universe, and that's called Earth. So what I want to do is go to the, the, the frozen surface of Jupiter's moon, moon Europa, cut a hole, go ice fishing down there, put a submersible, see if something swims up to the camera, camera and licks the lens. That's what I want to look for. Yeah. Look for life. Life. But Neil, you are looking for something. When was the last time you just went, I hope to discover something. <laughs> oh, you're always looking for something. No, but whenever we it's look for bad. something, we are often surprised. And I think that the point is that if we really could anticipate the progress of science, it almost, in some sense, wouldn't be worth doing because it we, we, means we'd already kind of know where we're going and what the answers are. And I think that, so when people ask me, what's the, what's the next great thing? I say, if I knew, I'd be doing it right now. And uh, so I think there is this sense we are driven by questions, interesting questions, but often those questions lead us to answers 
that lead to more interesting questions that are totally different than the ones we came up I'd with. I say not just often, but most times. Yeah, I so I think that... But you, but you can say something about the question which you really would wish to know the answer to. And, I mean, for, for me, it would be, what, what's consciousness? Oh, because yeah. because that's, that's totally baffling. Now, Richard, you know what I think? I agree. Not that you ask, but what I think on this is uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue about what consciousness is is drawn from the, in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books, not really, on, like, Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it, because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. <laughs> so, so, what I wonder, <laughs> what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I've got to say, like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And am, I, am I, like, thinking? Or am I just, like, thinking that I'm thinking? Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Will you Richard, stop? Oh, right, right, sorry. Richard. We went, we went decades, we went decades not understanding the precession of Mercury. It was this big mystery, and we invented solutions to it, like a mysterious planet Vulcan tugging on it such that the, its, per, its perihelion processed. And, and that wasn't the explanation at all. It was uh, obviously general relativity, another thing, not the original question <laughs> we were asking. So, you say you want to know what consciousness is, maybe that's not even the right question. How about oh. this? What's the nature of consciousness? Excellent. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I, Tracy, I think I want to uh, direct this one to you. Um, Who's you? To Tracy. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not Neil. I'll be happy. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 